Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on this afternoon show. Thought it'd be good to do an afternoon show on a Friday because uh, it's a good way to go into the weekend. Thank you so much to my mods. And for those of you who have agreed to mod, um, you'll see um, Peter Pranzo that I added you as a mod. And hopefully that's okay with you. I thought you were kind of feeling left out. So I put you in there. Uh, last time I did a live show, I had some really um, bad audio problems because of the Fios connection and there had been big storms that day. So if you guys can hear me okay and the audio is okay, can you put a one in the chat, please? Hi, Don Marie. Hello, Patroness Glow. How about a one? Don't sound like I'm underwater. Thank you. That's great. Hi, Don Marie. <laughs> Scott. Thank you, Scott. You know, I know a lot of you guys watch uh, Police Off the Cuff, and we did a show last night. Uh, I called it the core four. It was Bill and Phil and me and Mike. And Scott pointed out to me that some woman put some crazy comments in the chat, uh, not the chat, in on the comments uh, in the replay section after she had watched the video. And she like literally blamed Mike and I for women being abused. It was the most bizarre thing that I've ever seen. She's been blocked and... You know, she was talking about having to school us as, as lawyers like we were seven-year-old students. I, I don't know what she was talking about because I don't remember disparaging anyone last night on that show. And I thought it was just really, really bizarre. So just a little reminder to please be kind in the chat to each other. No personal attacks on me or each other. And if I see that, you will be blocked. So guide your actions accordingly. I've been warned. Thank you. Oh, Peter. Thank you. So what I wanted to do today is a deep dive on the Atlantic City 4, which um, is the case of what they have called the Eastbound Strangler. It's an unsolved case of four women who were found in 2006 outside of Atlantic City in a drainage ditch behind a seedy motel. If anyone knows about the Eastbound Strangler case and you're familiar with it, put a one in the chat. If you've never heard of this case, please put a two in the chat. Let's see what we have here. This case has been on my mind because ever since Rex Heerman was arrested, and thank you to whoever said this, somebody in one of the chats on one of the shows that I was on, I can't even remember which show it was, check out the Eastbound Strangler case. So of course, you know, somebody gives me a tip like that. I go into a rabbit hole and I have to now investigate this case and I have to see if there's any similarities. And it seemed to me, just the fact that there were four victims in Atlantic City, four victims found on Gilgo Beach in a row, you know, positioned in that exact way where they were a certain number of yards apart made me think, got to be a connection, right? Well, we're going to find out. Do a deep dive into this. Okay. So here we go. Just that one. Okay, so on November 20th of 2006, the remains of four victims were found in a drainage ditch, which was five feet wide and 10 feet deep behind this lovely Golden Key Motel in Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey, which is right outside of Atlantic City. Two women were taking a walk on a path behind the hotel and they stumbled upon a body in a drainage ditch. All of them were a few yards from each other. All were at different stages of decomposition. 
Three of them were posed in the same manner, in a ditch, face down, with their heads pointing east towards Atlantic City. Hence, the nickname Eastbound Strangler, for this person who has not been caught. All of them were barefoot. Barefoot. Space 50 to 60 yards apart. None of them had a cell phone or a purse or any other personal effects with them, and they were clothed except for being barefoot. All of the victims were mothers. All of them were heavy drug users. All of them came to Atlantic City in search of a better life. And all of them were escorts who worked on the track, which is what they called Pacific Avenue, which was about one street off of the boardwalk. And the track was and may still be, I'm not sure because I'm not in Atlantic City, <clears throat> frequent guest, was where escorts, and I'm going to use the term escorts because a lot of people have a lot of problems with the terminology. They don't like prostitutes. They don't like sex workers. I'm just going to use escorts as a blanket term because I just think it sounds more respectful. I don't know if you guys disagree, if you have a better word that you want to use, but that's the word that I'm going to use as a blanket term for women who trade money for sex. So while the first body to be discovered, and we'll get into this, was a woman named Kim Raffo, the first to go missing was a girl by the name of Molly Jean Dilts. Let me see here. Get Molly's picture up here. Molly Jean was from, she was 20 years old. She was from a town called Black Lick, Pennsylvania, which has been described as a mining town where money is tight and family is tighter. She re became rebellious, her uncle said, after she lost both her mother, her aunt, and her brother when she was a teenager. Her mother and her aunt died in the same week when she was 15 years old. And I believe it was her stepbrother who was found also dead by gunshot wound. She gave birth to a son and she seemed to be getting her act together until the summer of 2006 when she left her son with her family in pursuit of a new life. And she went to Atlantic City from Black Lick, Pennsylvania. On October 7th of 2006, she called her family for the last time. It was a collect call, which would be later traced to a payphone in Atlantic City. Identifying her body was going to be very difficult because she had been in the ditch for approximately six weeks. So law enforcement released a picture of her tattoos. And the tattoo that she had of an English bulldog was immediately recognized by her family. That's how she was identified. She was the only victim of the four who did not have a record for prostitution, but she was believed to be working as one, uh, an escort, by interviews that were done with friends and other girls on the track. She had fallen into the life, sadly. And... Her cause of death could not be determined due to decomposition, but so we're not sure what the cause of her death was and her toxic, toxic, okay. Toxicology reports done during autopsy showed only alcohol in her system. The next woman to go missing is um, Barbara Breda. She was 42 years old. She went missing on October 17th of 2006. Barbara grew up in the Philly suburbs in what her two sisters described as a stable, loving home. And she had summered at the Jersey Shore as a teenager. Devastated by the sudden death of her father, she left Penn State after a year and returned to the South Jersey Shore where she became a cocktail waitress at the Tropicana. 
she was the mother of a nine-year-old daughter and she was also a victim of DV. The abuse became so bad that she sadly developed a severe heroin addiction and she spent years in and out of rehab programs. Her daughter was taken away from her and put into foster care for a time and her daughter's father wound up in prison, which left her alone, sadly, and she turned to escorting to survive. Her sisters tried to file a missing persons report when she went missing, but her sisters have said that they weren't taken seriously because of what Barbara did for a living. And she'll have history of an arrest for escorting, let's say. So sisters felt like that missing person report was not taken seriously. Her cause of death could not be determined as well due to decomposition, but her toxicology report on the autopsy showed a potentially lethal amount of heroin. The third young lady to go missing was Tracy Roberts. She was 23 years old. She was originally from a small town in Delaware. She dropped out of high school at age 16. And after having a baby at age 18 with her boyfriend, she became a medical assistant. She actually went, she got trained and she became a medical assistant. She got a really good job at a doctor's office and she saved up and she bought a townhouse for herself and her boyfriend and her baby. But she sadly lost her job when the doctor that she worked for moved. And because she was unable to find another job and make her mortgage payments, her townhouse was foreclosed on and she lost her home. After she broke up with her boyfriend who took custody of their child, Tracy became an exotic dancer who became an escort to support a heavy cocaine habit. She drifted between Philly and Atlantic City and she was last seen alive on November 8th of 2006 when she was punched in the throat and hospitalized by a man who wanted to be her pimp. She called her mother from the hospital and told her mother what happened and that she wanted to come home to Delaware and her mother jumped in the car and drove the 90 minutes to the hospital to pick Tracy up. But her mother was five minutes too late. Tracy had checked herself out of the hospital and she was seen leaving with two men. 12 days later, her body was found. She had been asphyxiated by choking or some other manner. Her toxicology report showed a large amount of cocaine. The last of the four to go missing was Kim Raffo. She was 35 years old and she was last seen alive on November 19th of 2006, which was one day before the bodies were found. She was originally from Canarsie, Brooklyn, where her cousin Juliet remembered her as always smiling and always happy. Her younger sister, Marie, however, tells a different story of a home life with a father whose alcoholism and drug abuse terrorized their lives. Kim wanted to escape that life. And she married a man named Hugh Oslander in 1989, moved to Florida, bought a four bedroom home in Pembroke Pines and had two lovely children where she was a stay at home mom, a super mom really. She was involved in the PCA and Girl Scouts and carpools. They seem to have led a very normal life. In 2001, she started a drug-fueled affair with a chef she met in a cooking class by the name of Kenny Balecki, whose own mother described him as a chronic drug addict. When Hugh, her husband, found out about the affair, he attacked Kenny with a baseball bat near the summer trip. So Hugh, her husband, told her to move to city, New Jersey with the children. But after another fight between Hugh and Kenny, the children were removed from by authority and put into foster care. Kim and Kenny moved to Atlantic City to be closer to her children. She really missed her children. For a while, Kim and Kenny seemed to get their act together, and they both worked at the Taj Mahal Casino for a while until what Kenny described in, in an interview that I read, the constant approach of drug dealers every time they left their apartment building became too tempting. Conflicting reports, their drug use started, but 
That's what he says. Q, her husband said that they started smoking crack very heavily when they first started their affair before they moved to Atlantic City. Soon, their life turned to smoking crack, a hardcore addiction that had Kenny turned to shoplifting and Kim to escorting to feed their habit. But on September 9th of 2006, while Kenny was in jail for shoplifting, Hugh arrived in Atlantic City to rescue Kim, and she agreed to go with him to Long Island. Interesting connection. Where she spent the ne next several weeks clean and sober on Long Island. In mid-November, she made the what would be a fatal decision to return to Atlantic City. And on the morning of November 19th, she was seen getting into a car with a John who took her to the Taj Mahal, but apparently she left him around 5 a.m. to score drugs. Her body was found on November 20th. She was strangled with a rope or a cord and toxicology reports showed large amounts of cocaine in her system. Oh, I'm cutting in and out again. How's it now? Check the audio. What is going on? This is like a really fancy mic. Hang on. I'm going to unplug it and plug it back in. Okay, is that any better? This is any better? Okay, how's that? Good? Unplugged, plugged it back in. You know, you got to reboot sometimes. Sometimes you got to reboot. Bizarre things work. Technology is not your friend. All right, Wendy can't hear anything. All right, five out of five, says Peter. All right, I think we're good. All right. Oh, yes, please hit the like button while we're here, while we're talking about it. Amazing. And if you're not a subscriber, I would love it if you would subscribe. It's funny because uh, YouTube shows you all of these statistics, way too many statistics than I need to know, but 80% of the people who watch my video are not sub videos are not subscribed to my channel. So I don't know. Subscribe, hit the bell, then you'll never miss a thing. Okay. So there you have it. Descriptions of the women who were tragically killed by this eastbound strangler in November of 2006 behind a seedy motel. Anybody similarities between these victims and the victim on the beach? All, all of them were escorts. All of them were placed some distance apart. I don't know if it's been released, which way the heads were facing in the Gilgo case. They've kept a lot from us on the Gilgo case. If anybody knows, please let me know. I know a lot of you are more familiar with the details of 
both of these cases than I am. Here's a graphic. of the position that the bodies were found. Uh, number one is at the bottom of the screen. That's where the first body was found. Number two, directly to the left of that. Number three, to the left of that. And number four, to the left of that. It's curious to me because it seems very very similar to the way the Gilgo four were also found. So back in 2006, law enforcement went to a man named John Kelly, who's a profiler. He's also a psychotherapist who runs an organization Stalk, S-T-A-L-K, Inc., which is an organization of former cops and mental health professionals. And they put out a profile of the Eastbound Strangler. And I want to go through that with you because I found this to be interesting as well. So I'm just going to make this bigger for you. Okay, so the initial profiler of the Eastbound Strangler by John Kelly read as follows. <clears throat> this le lethal predator is a local male who is very familiar with the Atlantic City area and the disposal site of his victims. Something that I found interesting was that Rex Hureman was married for the first time in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And while I couldn't find any indication of where he lived with his first wife, Elizabeth Ryan, they were married in 1990 when Rex was 26 years old and they had a three-year marriage. I've also read reports and any of you who could tell me if you have seen this as well, because when I went back to look for it, it may have been redacted. But in some of the initial reports, when they were, were, were reporting on where Rex Sherman owned properties, I did see something I know I did in the beginning that he owned two properties in New Jersey. If anybody else saw that, let me know. The second point of this profile is that he has a very organized personality, which influences his personal and everyday activities, including his work. Hureman is an architect. He's very rigid and structured in his everyday life. A place for everything and everything in its place would be his motto. We've seen pictures of the house and the house looks very disheveled and looks like something out of hoarders. So it, I don't know that he was rigid and structured in his everyday life, but he may have been outside of his home. He has read and reads books on serial killers and has some knowledge of crime scenes and crime investigations. He has an extreme foot fetish and has a collection of women's shoes and the shoe. This I believe was based that these four women in Atlantic City were found barefoot. I've read a lot on the Gilgo Beach Four since this case broke in 2010. And it has been reported that there was a significant piece of clothing missing from the victims. And I'm wondering if that was shoes. I don't know. But if it is, it seems like something to be ignored. Yes, Rochelle, uh, Elizabeth Ryan. Yes, they were they were wedded. Uh, they were wedded. They were wedded. Yeah, changed their wedding vows in New Brunswick in 1990. That's what I as well when he was 26. Hello, Louis Lamarocco. 
Yeah, Ed, Ed says he has two properties in New Jersey. Interesting. If, if, Ed, if you can find out where those properties are, that would really be interesting. He has not killed every prostitute he has come into contact with. There are prostitutes who know him for the sexual gratification he gets from their feet. This is interesting, too, because there was a woman named Nikki who was interviewed all over every station the other day. And she said that she went out with him for a date. Here, man, we're talking about now in Port Jefferson, maybe in five or six or seven years ago. And that she got away from him. He wanted her to get in his car and go back with him to his home, I believe. And she did not. She got away. So she had a really weird feeling about him when he started bringing up the Gilda Beach murders and she got away from him. He is non-social and likes to keep to himself. That is something also that his neighbors have said. People who he's lived there, I guess, his entire life. He grew up in that house. And at some point he bought that house from his mother. And his, his neighbors have said that he is sort of non-social and nobody really knew him. Okay, thank you, Rochella. Regarding the first marriage, the couple resided in Long Island. I want to say on Long Island. I'm not saying in Long Island. I hate when, I, mean, I know you're quoting from an article, but anybody who lives on Long Island knows that you live on an island, not in an island. So I'm picky about that. Uh, where they raised their two children, a daughter named Victoria and a son. Oh, we're talking about his first marriage? I thought his daughter is from his second marriage to the woman who just filed for divorce the other day. So yeah, there's some conflicting reports about that. He's narcissistic. Everything revolves around him. And he's also very concerned with making himself look good in all aspects. We've seen that. If you've watched the video that has been on YouTube, um, but apparently the guy who took this video, he was some sort of a real estate broker or something, did a video with Hureman from, I think it was about a year ago. And it was a really bizarre interview. And they've shown it on a lot of news stations. I think, I believe it's a French gentleman who's interviewing Hureman German's office and you can just see by his mannerisms and the way he speaks that he is narcissistic and that he is very concerned with making himself look good in all aspects I agree with that part of the profile he is ex also extremely opinionated if criticized or disagreed with he would become extremely angry or agitated although at times when he wants to he can be very charming you can also see that in the video where he does try and be charming. And in fact, Nikki, uh, the girl who went on the date with him, who was all over the news the other day, did say that he was charming and that he seemed normal at first until he started talking about the Gilgo Beach case. In his pre-offense mode, he may have spoken about the sinful nature of prostitution or he may have voiced economic concerns about prostitutes destroying Atlantic City's value or reputation. In post defense mode, he would say they got what they deserved for good riddance. Another thing that Nikki brought up in her interviews was that she indicated that she got the feeling that he was talking to her like, you know, the victims kind of deserved it. They were only, you know, quote, sex workers anyway. They didn't really matter. And that's kind of the way that he made her felt, her feel during their conversations. He follows the news of his killings in the media. Well, we know that about Hureman based on the Google searches that we went over that were in the bail application. His Google searches were all about the killings, about the women, about the women's relatives, about the task force. His hobbies would include art and photography, and his obsessive fantasies would compel him to search for sexually graphic and or violent pictures in the media. We saw that as well. 
I redacted the Google searches uh, for the, the, the P that he was looking for because they were so explicit and so disgusting and so foul that I didn't even want to read them to you. You can find them. They are horrific. To say sexually graphic is putting it mildly. They were definitely violent and they were definitely graphic. He probably has a prior record of sexual or physical abuse or sexual harassment toward women. He may have recently suffered a setback in his work or in a relationship. On Bill's show last night, Bill brought up the fact that he was in debt, I think, to the IRS to the tune of something like a quarter of a million dollars. I haven't verified that, but if Bill says it's true, I'm sure that he verified it. May have been a, a, a setback. Considered a setback for sure. This predator is probably detached from his father and was abused as a child. Now, I haven't read a lot about his relationship with his father or whether there was any abuse, but I do know that his brother, Craig, was involved in 1988 in a car accident where he was arrested for drunk driving. His blood alcohol content was 0.2, twice the legal limit. And he was also on, he was coked out and he killed a housing authority police captain in 1988. And he went to jail for three years. That's Craig, Rex's brother. Steph says his father passed away when he was 11 or 12. Okay, well, well then that kind of fits this profile. This person has also killed before. These recent victims were found and he will be compelled to continue his murderous ways in the future. Tell me what you think about this profile. Any similarities? Any thoughts on whether he's connected to these cases? I did read in the post today because that's where I get my news is the New York Post. There was a breaking uh, story from about eight o'clock this morning when I had already decided to do this show and had already done all the research on it that uh, Rodney Harrison, who is the Suffolk County Police Commissioner, did come out and say that they are closely looking at the Atlantic City killings and seeing if they can link him. Also interesting is that in 2006 or later, there were suspects. There was at least one suspect who was ruled out because his DNA was not a match, which indicates to me that they have the DNA. They've got the DNA. All they need to do now is try and match it. But we know that that takes, it takes time. Another similarity that I looked at was the similarity in dump sites near the ocean in a marshy area, the pattern of four, the fact that they were all escorts. I watched an interview with a profiler who was an expert on serial killers. And he said that oftentimes serial killers will pick their dump sites based on sound, the sound of the ocean, the sound of the wind near the water, it just seems to me to be too similar to discount. John Kelly also gave uh, an interview. He's the profiler whose profile we just looked at. And he said, um, when he asked about what kind of person would commit these crimes, he said, a man on a mission, and his mission is to eliminate prostitutes. He put them in a sewer because he thinks of them as trash. Crazy, right? Something else that I found interesting that could be a connection is that in uh, September of 2000, Valerie Mack, who was 24 years old, went missing. She was an escort from Philly. 
She was last seen in the spring or summer of 2000. She grew up in Egg Harbor, New Jersey. And she was last seen in Port Republic, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Her torso was found in September of 2000 in Matterville on Long Island. A lot of connections here. Tell me what you think. Cassio fan, I think he's connected. When did plate readers become a thing in New York and New Jersey? There are a hundred these days. I, I don't know, does anybody know? I mean, we've had easy pass for a very long time. I wanna say that easy pass did exist all the way back in 2006 for sure. If anybody knows the answer to that question, let me know what you think. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing that could be traced. You know, was this guy a gambler? Did he spend a lot of time in Atlantic City? Hi, Frank and Marsha. Frank and Marsha? Or Frank, maybe your last name is Marsha. There's no way Rags had stopped killing after 2010 and before 2007. How many more victims are out there? I agree. I agree. And I've said this before. I think we might find out that this guy is one of the most prolific serial killers of all time. I mean, they're going to track his movements. They're going to track his credit cards. They're going to track his cell phones. And Deb says, I think he started as a teen. Maybe. Robbie. Hi, Robbie. Uh, Robbie thinks Rex and his brother are connected in these cases. Well, you know what I find really interesting is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know you will, but <clears throat> this guy had two green Chevy Avalanches. One of them he gave to his brother, I think in 2015. One of them was connected to him all the way back in 2010 when one of the witnesses who lived with Amber Costello identified him as being an ogre and six foot six and driving a green Chevy Avalanche. It's amazing to me that these cars are still in his possession and that I think there were two of them. So yeah, if he and his brother are connected and they both had the same car, was there a reason for that? Steph says he also spent time in Vegas. Yeah, maybe he is a gambler. Maybe, you know, he liked these seedy type areas where, you know, Escorting is legal in Las Vegas. You know, one difference that I find between this and the Gilgo case is that in this case, it seemed like these women were picked up along the track. And in the Gilgo case, they were actually solicited through Craigslist ads and back page ads and things like Tinder. So how much easier would it be for a serial killer to pick up his victims by just driving down a street and knowing that the person he was picking up was a willing participant. He didn't have to buy them dinner like he did to, with this girl, Nikki. Um, and, you know, we know from what we know about these guys is that their methods evolve. Their MOs evolve. Happy Cappy says, if they follow the money, they will find the bodies. Always, always follow the money. It's the answer to a lot of things. Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is always the best. Okay, Magical Mary on the Google. Thank you for that. Um, plate readers in New York, New Jersey started in 2012 to 2014. That may be. But I do know that the easy pass was tracked before that. And I, it may not have read your plate, but it definitely read your easy pass number. So they knew that your reader was going, was going through. I just have something to swim by that I wanted to. Ed Sorella. And Ed Sorella, I saw you last night in the chat and you indicated that you live a block away from Hearman. Is that right? Or on the next block? 
And Ed says that green avalanche was parked right outside for years. For years. So it's confusing to me because when we read through the bail application, um, there were statements made by the man or one of the men who lived with Amber Costello, who gave a physical description of Herman saying that he looked like an ogre. He was six foot six, six foot four to six foot six, had bushy eyebrows. He was around 240, uh, not bushy eyebrows. I'm thinking of, you know, that other case. He had um, bushy hair and big 70s style eyeglasses and that he drove a green Chevy Avalanche. So it's conflicting whether they just got this description now when they started the task force back in 2022, or they had that description back in 2010. And if anybody has any clarity on that, please let me know. Because it seems to me that if they put that description out in 2010, Ed Sorella, who lived on the next block, might have been like, oh, there's a guy who looks like an ogre who lives a block over from me who has a green Chevy Avalanche park out, parked right outside of his house. Somebody said, well, there was a whole change in the police authority when the avalanche was reported. Yep. Bigger hunting ground in Vegas. Tim says if they did not follow up on leads, it was easy to miss. Scott, thanks, Scott. Oh, Scott, were you okay with being a moderator? I thought you, uh, I read some comments, but you know, it's hard to, you know, get the the gist of the comments when uh, when, when you're not really having a on. Suffolk sat on the info for the green vehicle. They didn't know it was an avalanche back then, just a green SUV. Interesting. But what about the description of the, the perp? Did they sit on that too? Did they put that out to the public? Okay. Anne-Marie says, I disagree with the title escorts. The term prostitute is accurate and may dissuade someone from that lifestyle these women were someone's mother a child who sadly took a dark path that's and i totally agree with you and that is why i wanted to humanize the victims and that's why i gave you know a complete bio of every single one of these women because every single one of these women was a mother they were someone's daughter they were someone's sister they were someone's aunt they were someone's wife or girlfriend and just because they fell into this life does not in any way make them less important or less valuable than any other person who goes myth missing or who is a victim of a horrific crime like this. And I spent the entirety of my legal career advocating for victims of SA, mostly children, and adults who had disclosed as adults what happened to them and trying to change the law in New York because the law in New York was so friendly to abusers that if a certain amount of years went by, they couldn't be arrested, the perp. So that law finally changed. It's called the Child Victims Act and it was changed a couple of years ago. But I got involved in these type of cases in 2002, and it was a long, hard road. Hi, Robbie. Uh, can Rex plead insane? You know, that remains to be seen. I mean... We do in New York accept the insanity defense, but we're going to have to see what happens with this case, whether it even goes to trial. I mean, there could be so much more. Well, I'm sure there is so much more evidence that we don't know about yet. And if he's connected to other crimes in other states, there's going to be a lot more charges. I think based on what we've seen 
interview wise of him and people who have known him. I don't know. I don't know. But anything is possible. You know, anything's possible. Oops. I don't know that I meant to. I'm glad they're checking out properties in South Carolina. I think where he has a place with his brother. Yeah. Peter. Peter Pranzo says the first Gilgo task force was a failure. Egos with a splash of internal Suffolk County PD problems. Second go around with fresh minds worked. Rodney Harrison top shelf, hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, when Rodney Harrison came to Suffolk County, I think it was in 2002, which was, was around the same time that Ray Turney, Ray Tierney, who's the district attorney for Suffolk County took office and they assembled that task force right away with Suffolk County PD, the sheriff's office, the FBI, the state police, everybody worked together. They checked their egos out the door and they had this guy in custody within 18 months, within 18 months. And the amount of evidence that they had to sift through between phone records, burner phone records, you know, cell phone records of the victims, uh, the locations, the call data, the American Express, the financial records. I mean, they really connected the dots on this thing. Uh, you know, in a way that I think is, if we're going to compare it to Koberger, which is where we've also seen a lot of cell phone data and electronic evidence. I think this one has, the, the volume is way, way more in this case than it is in Koberger, but we don't know everything they have in Koberger yet. And that's just my personal opinion. If it is cross state, Tim, if it is cross state, it turns federal. And can he get the death? I don't know. The death penalty, there's no death penalty in New York. I don't know if there's the death penalty in New Jersey. Does anybody know that? And I don't know. Well, if, if he cross state lines, it could be federal. Mm, I, you know, I really can't opine on that because I don't know. I don't know the answer, but I know that if he is, um, if he's indicted in another state that does have the death penalty and they choose to prosecute him in that state as well, then he could get the death penalty in that state. Uh, do I think it's possible they kept a lot to the vest to not tip off rags? Well, if, if you take a look at his Google searches, he was following the investigation very, very, very closely. And he knew about the task force and he kept checking the website because there is a website that has all of the information that they have on the Gilgo cases. And in fact, he was still soliciting um, escorts, I'm still going to use that term, during the pendency of this investigation. And the reason that the police or law enforcement or Suffolk County PD moved in to arrest him at his office the night that they did, which I think was July 13th, was because they were very, very worried that he was going to strike again. And they had to get him in custody before he was able to do that. Teresa says, 48 Hours has a good episode on here about the police corruption behind the scenes in this, this case. Okay, great. I'll have to check that out. Patron is slow. He must have thought he would never get caught then. I mean, you know, that's something we see in a lot of cases where these guys are so narcissistic. They think they're above the law. They think they're never going to get caught. And eventually they do. And, and I think, you know, the first thing he said, or one of the first things that he said when he was arrested was, is it in the news? As if he really wanted to be famous and he wanted it to be in the news. And we see this a lot with a lot of killers and a lot of serial killers that they just want their 15 minutes of fame. It's, it's disgusting. He had, yeah, he had 95 permits for, for guns. And I think, I don't know what the latest count is, but the last time I saw something on this, they had collected at least 200 guns from his house. He says, I think when the Suffolk County Sheriff, Sheriff got involved in this case, it made a big difference. Inmates do talk about what's going on in cases on the outside. You'd be surprised what you will learn. Yeah, that is true. 
I saw interviews with um, with three women who had contact with him. The, the woman, Nikki, that we um, were talking about before. There was also a girl who posted a video on TikTok, which you may have seen. She was involved in a networking group with Herman. And she said that Herman tried to talk to her one day about the Gilgo Beach murders. And asked her, do you know about these, this case? And she said, well, yeah, of course I do. And he said, you know, this guy killed 10 and then there was, he said the same thing to Nikki. And then he said, uh, there was a woman who, she was not named, but she was a client of his because Herman was an, an expediter in the city. He helped people get permits for renovations and things. And I think she had a brownstone in Brooklyn. And she told a story to, when the story broke, she called her real estate broker and told him, oh my God, I drove him home one night to Long Island because he missed his train or something. And on the way home, he started talking to me about the Gilgo Beach murders and started talking about how there were 10 murders. So, you know, if he's only involved with these four and we know about 10 or 11 bodies in the area, why is he telling everybody 10? Is it an admission? It kind of sounds like it could be to me. I don't know. Thank you so much, Deb Jackson. I appreciate that so much. Oh, thanks for leaving me a message on Instagram. I love that. He's a very depraved, dangerous person. Yeah, I agree. Shout out to Crystal Lee watching from uh, New South Wales, Australia. It's amazing that Robbie's from Australia too, that we have viewers who are all over the world, really. I mean, this is going to be an international story if it's not already. Heidi Cakes, thank you. She just uh, Googled no death penalty in New Jersey abolished in 20, 2007. All right. Well, what about Nevada? Anybody know about Nevada? South Carolina? I believe South Carolina does have the death penalty. But I'm not sure. Because of Murdoch. Was he up for the death penalty? Well, it seems to me like there are, yes, a young lady. Here's another thing. A young lady um, on July 3rd contacted police about a man who approached her on her walk. Yes, it was in a park, I believe, near Herman's house. And when she described him, that's when they picked him up, I believe. Yeah, that was um, very interesting. She felt very threatened by him. And he, he, he kept popping out of the bushes during her walk. And she said that he was very disheveled and very sweaty. And he tried to engage her in conversation and she got so nervous that she called her sister to come pick her up. And she actually called the police and made a report. And you're right, that may be when they started to close in on him a little bit more because they saw that he was actually making contact with people in public to the point where he was going to try and maybe do something. So I guess we're going to find out maybe relatively quickly, maybe not, about whether or not he's a suspect in these Atlantic City cases. You know, we, it also needs to be seen whether or not he's a suspect in Shannon Gilbert's case. Because if you recall, I believe Shannon Gilbert was also from New Jersey and she was reported missing right around the same time as Melissa Bartholomew, Lorraine Brainerd Barnes, Megan Waterman, and Amber Castillo, they were all reported missing between, well, Maureen Brainerd Barnes was 2007, Melissa was 2009. But Shannon Gilbert went missing in May of 2010, Megan Waterman went missing in June of 2010, and Amber Costello went missing in September of 2010. The four bodies were found in December of 2010, but Shannon was not discovered until a year later, December of 2011. And originally, still, I think, Shannon's death was ruled an accident, that she ran out into the marsh and fell and hit her head. And that they were opining that she may have been on drugs or drunk or something, which caused her death. But uh, a private autopsy done by Dr. Michael Bodden, who is one of the most famous forensic pathologists out there 
he did an independent autopsy on Channing Gilbert and he came to the opinion that she was strangled, which is the same MO as at least two or more of the Gilgo victims. So I think, um, I think we may find out some more about that case. Hopefully they're going to reopen the investigation into that case because it took until May, I think, of 2022 until they finally released the 911 calls that Shannon made that evening that she went missing. And they're just very difficult to listen to, but um, we're going to see what happens with that uh, as well. Let's see. I just saw an interesting question in here. Hit that bell and smash the like button. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Donna, for tuning in. Guys, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe and hit the bell so that you will be notified when I post a video or go live. I find that going live is a lot more fun because I really love interacting with you guys. And I, and I think that um, it's more engaging. I find that um, if, if I record videos and then post them, it's kind of like it's going into a black hole. And, and plus, it takes a lot of time to record a video and then edit it and then insert your media and stuff. And I had a lot of media pulled, but I like to talk so much that it's hard for me to play videos because also a lot of times you can get a copyright strike from YouTube and then they will bury your video because somebody will complain that you used their video. So I like to do that. Now, anyway, I mean, you know, sometimes you can play stuff and they won't get you, but sometimes they do. Somebody put it, and I think, I think it was Robbie, asked if you're, um, if you are assigned to represent a person like Herman, are you allowed to decline? You know, public defenders are public defenders for a reason. They really believe in the system. They really believe that every defendant deserves a defense, and. You know, you could decline, but if you do, you're probably not going to get assigned any more cases. It's not a good look. And also remember, the defense does not need to prove innocence. The defense does not need to prove anything. They do not need to even put up a defense. Some people have asked, you know, what, are, what do you think his defense is going to be? He doesn't need to have a defense. The prosecution has to prove their case and every element of their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And the burden of proof is on the prosecution here. So... His attorney doesn't need to even put on a case if he doesn't want to. But yes, he has been assigned counsel in Suffolk County. Anybody else have any questions for me before we get moving here? Because we are up to an hour. Oh, thank you, Jerry. Much more interesting to hear my insights instead of clips. I do like to talk a lot, so... That's why it's hard for me to be on a show where there's a lot of guests because I'm always like, last night I was raising my hand like, ah, I hate interrupting. And it's not I, I, when I, it's not that I'm being rude. It's just that I kind of forget what I'm going to say because I have, you know, early onset something. George Washington, is that your real name? This interaction is more fun. I agree. I'm with you. Happy Cappy, I think she was chased into the swamp and murdered. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm not going to put any crazy theories out there, but let's say, let's say maybe she ran out into Ocean Parkway. And maybe because, you know, where she was is, is adjacent, is Ocean Parkway adjacent. Where she was, was close to the dump site for the Gilgo Four. What if she, because the police are saying that they ruled out a suspect, the John that she went to see in Oak Beach, as well as her driver, this guy named Michael Pack, who drove her there that night. What if she ran out onto Ocean Parkway, flagged down a car, or Chevy Avalanche, and the person in that car was taking a drive to visit his dump site? Because we know that serial killers like to go back and visit the dump site, right? It's like some weird sort of excitement for them. Michael T says, where is he being held right now? Uh, he's being held in Suffolk County Correctional Facility in Riverhead, and he's on suicide watch. And while he is not in solitary, he is, he is in isolation, and I believe there are two guards watching him at all times. 
They do not want another Epstein on their hands in Suffolk County. And uh, they are really treating this with the kind of, you know, importance that it deserves because this guy needs to stay alive, needs to stand trial, and we need to get justice for at least the three women that he's indicted uh, for who are Amber Costello. Let me just go back to my notes here. Melissa Bartholomew and Megan Waterman. And I do expect that an indictment on Maureen Brainerd Barnes will be coming soon. They did not have enough evidence on her case to take it to the grand jury because her, the circumstances of her disappearance happened in 2007. And it was set forth in the bail application that they could not retain or they could not retrieve, I should say, cell phone records and cell phone data from all the way back in 2007. So they could not triangulate the phones like they did for the other three victims where he had actually taken two of the victim's phones with him. So they had triangulation of cell phone data where he had his own personal phone, his burner phone, and the victim's phone all in the same place at the same time. And there were several instances of that. And in fact, the application, the bail application, the affidavit said, we could not find one instance where those phones were in different places at the same time. It's also noted that he took one of the victim's phones, Melissa Bartholomew's phone, and with her phone called her sister and taunted her saying that, what he had done to her and that he had killed her. And her sister was 15 years old, 15 years old. And he's allegedly terrorizing this child. It's despicable and disgusting. Yes, I agree with you, Peter. Got to get him to give up his other victims. Not easy without the DP as a bargaining tool. It's right. Because a lot of times, you know, law enforcement will say, or the district attorney will cut you a deal. We'll take it off the table. Give us this, or if they give us that, it's a bargaining chip. Rochella. Rochella says, can you believe they are now saying that he may have killed some of these ladies in his Massapequa home? I absolutely can believe that because when they started, uh, when they started going through his home, the reporters at the end of the block could see what they were doing and they could zoom in really, really, really well. And they could see what was being taken out of the house. And they were able to see books and notes and they could really zoom in and get some great detail on what was coming out of that house. There was a life-size doll, a child-size life-size doll taken out in a glass case. There was a portrait of a battered woman or a painting of a battered woman taken out of that house. The basement has those steel doors that you kind of have to pull up to get into like the basement. And there was some sort of secret room back there. I think it's been reported. Um, and I think he told a neighbor when he was buying some special doors that he was buying them to keep his guns behind there. Super, super weird stuff. So, you know, the question becomes, it's been shown that his wife was out of town during the time of those three that he's been indicted on. She was either in Iceland or somewhere else in the country during that time, even though her hair was found on three of the victims and his hair was found on one of the victims. They don't think she's involved at this point. But I don't think that, I don't think personally that he killed them and dumped them in the same place. The fact that he asked Nikki to come back with him to his house makes me think that perhaps there was some place in the house where he brought them and who knows how long he kept them before unaliving them. Also, it's been reported that 
with at least two of the two of the victims' phones, I think that he did have, he called their phones to retrieve their voicemail. Now, I don't remember back in 2007. I mean, I had a cell phone going back to the time when the cell phone was hardwired into my car and the receiver of the phone was actually a receiver and it had a cord on it, you know, and that was in, let me say like the late 90s. So I don't remember if back in 2010, you needed a password to retrieve your voicemail or if you could just get it from your cell phone and retrieve your voicemail without it. Because that begs the question, did he have, did he keep them around and somehow get their password out of them? Like, why was he retrieving their voicemail? To see if anybody was looking for them? To see if they were missing? To see if anybody had said in the voicemail, like, if you don't call me back right away, I'm going to, like, file a missing persons report with the cops? So. Oh. Hi, Ed. It's nice to see you. Ed says, do you believe his wife really had no idea anything was going on and they must have been at the house if they found her hair on them? No. People have said, and there are a lot of family of serial killers that have come out and said, like, we had no idea. We just had no idea. You know, we don't know what their relationship was, if they really, you know, had any communication. I mean, it seems like he was out of the house a lot and coming home at weird hours of the night. She may have just thought he was at work. And also um, the fact that her hair was found on them doesn't necessarily mean that they were at the house because there have been a lot of experts who've come out and said that it could have been, you know, transference hair, that women have hair that sheds a lot, that his wife's hair could have been in his car or he could have picked it up in the house on his sweater or some other way. So it doesn't necessarily show um, that they were in the house, but it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, Heidi. Um, Bill said it was an old storm cellar with doors like in the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, you do enter it from the outside. And they're like these steel doors that you have. It's kind of like a like a storm basement, a storm cellar, I guess you could say. I know that my parents had one in the house that they owned. And it was um, would open these steel doors and then go down. And everything down there was uh, was concrete. Like the whole, it's like underneath the house, everything was concrete. But apparently he built some kind of secret room back there. And um uh, they're reporting last night, they were reporting they found handcuffs and other things. So we just don't know. I think there's a lot more to this story. And yeah, I agree. Um, Dana, Dana says, many serial killers, families have said, this is not the man we all knew as a father or grandfather or husband. Yep. Yep. Crazy, crazy story. I think there's a lot more to come. Thank you all for joining me for this afternoon edition. And I think that um, it's it's interesting. You know, I fell into this rabbit hole and I, I really wanted to come out here and talk about this because from what I could see, nobody else was really talking about it. I had found some old videos where people were trying to connect the two, the Gilgo 4 and the Eastbound Strangler 4, but nothing recent really. So I wanted to come on here and talk about it with you guys and get your opinion on it. And I guess we'll see. It remains to be seen whether or not they can connect him to this. But uh, yes, that collectors, I talked about this last night. They did find two storage units owned by Herman in Amityville. And during uh, the search on day, I think it was the same day the arrest was announced, or perhaps the next day, they showed video of the Suffolk County Medical Examiner's truck at one of the storage units. And Trust me, I don't think they're wasting the medical examiner's time to come out there to a scene where they think they maybe might find something. That indicates to me that they they found some kind of remains in that storage unit. Maybe that's where he took them. Anybody ever watched, I know this is a crazy comparison, but anybody ever watched Dexter? You know, Dexter had a whole room and a whole setup with plastic everywhere. And I believe there was a storage unit involved at one point, and at this point, nothing will shock me about this case. Nothing will shock me. Oh, and, and Ed says the Emmy is back today and Ed lives around the corner. So Ed, I might have to have you on, email me. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Wendy. Wendy, thank you so much for moderating today and all of my moderators. I appreciate you so, 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 so much because 
based on those comments that I saw on Bill's video from last night about me, attack, an attack on me and an attack on Mike personally that I was just floored by, apparently we do need to keep the bullies out of the chat and block them or put them in timeout or whatever it is that YouTube does. But thank you so much. Yes, before we all go, Tony Bennett did die today. RIP Tony Bennett. Very, very sad. Yes. Okay. Here's one more thing. Thank you, George Washington, for pointing this out because I did see this <clears throat> last night. It's a show called The Killing Season. I believe it's on A&E. Um, it's about the long LISK. Someone said, what is LISK? And that's what it is, stands for, the Long Island Serial Killer. Um, and it's been free since last night. And it's, I think, eight episodes all about the Gilgo case. So I haven't checked it out yet. I did see it, just a little clip from episode one. And I found it very, very interesting. So it might be something to check out in case you haven't seen any of the other documentaries on this. I know there was also a Lifetime movie and I think there was a Netflix documentary and um, we'll see what happens. Thank you so much. You guys are the best. I'll see you again soon. Have a great day and a great weekend. Bye.